Hello and welcome to this lesson on technical mathematics problem solving on the GMAT quantitative section. So this tactical process for technical mathematics is going to sometimes be the only reasonable tactic. If you see a clearly technical uh, math problem on the GMAT where they're not obscuring any of the information behind kind of opaque words, you may be looking at a scenario where technical math is your only option. And it's going to only, however, require basic arithmetic, algebraic, and geometric skills. The math level on the test is not going to be uh, anything beyond basic algebra 2, and that's like really low in quadratics. So that's the good news. But the bad news is that the GMAT itself does not necessarily associate technical mathematics with a high difficulty. So what that means is you're not rewarded for necessarily completing some of the arithmetic, algebraic, or geometric technical math that you, at the beginning of your prep, may consider to be kind of some of the harder things to do just because you're out of practice. So the strategic implications of technical math on the exam is that Firstly, you want to always attempt the technical approach first, because if you can do the technical approach, it's probably fastest. But you really have to have a tight leash on the technical approach, because as soon as it ceases to be both apparent and simple to you in the moment, you want to get off of the technical approach. So what that means is apparent is that you can set up the math. So you know how to create the algebra, you know how to set up the geometry, the arithmetic oftentimes is just kind of there implicitly as part and really explicitly as a tacit aspect of the exam. But apparent means that you can set up the, the math and sometimes it immediately is apparent because they don't hide the math from you. So sometimes on these questions, as we'll see in a couple of examples here in a moment, it really is apparent to start. Simple means that you personally can solve the math. So sometimes they'll give you the math and it's apparent but it's not simple so then it's not really the tactic that you want to use also note the numbering format in your problem and in the choices to inform efficient calculations so what that means is you want to make sure that you stay in fractions for instance if your answer choices are in fractions if you are in decimals or percents the same thing make sure that you are math ambidextrous and not forcing yourself into a position where you have to use one specific number format for non-integer values all the time now, let's start with just a word problem example. So, as always, we're going to set up the scratch pad. We've got our choices. We'd write these out vertically, A through E, but you're probably not going to write out the expressions themselves. That's going to be a little too time consuming. So instead, we just have them as that on the screen. Then, of course, you want to skip to the end of the problem, identify what you're being asked for, and we'd label the choices as such. So in this case, we're being asked for the number of minutes it would take Callum to travel 10 miles at the average of Abby's and Barry's rates. So the number of minutes for C, and we've just turned Callum into C, to travel 10 miles. Then you want to read from the beginning, taking notes, and setting up equations as you go, because you, you can see in your answer choices that, that they're looking for an algebraic expression as the solution. So that just is kind of a clue. Again, note the format of the choices as to what you may need to do. So we know that you begin with just a rate is equal to distance over time. You can rearrange that formula to figure out that time is equal to distance over your rate. Then we have to find the average of the rates. And we know from the beginning that Abby travels 4 miles in A minutes, so her rate is 4 over A, and Barry travels 2 miles in B minutes, so that's going to be 2 over B. And then you've got to take the average of those two rates, so you divide by 2. So you have to process the fraction. You're going to have to sum with a common denominator your uh, fraction in the numerator. So that gets you a common denominator of AB. Then you've got 4B plus 2A over that AB, which is then divided by 2 again. And that produces your ultimate denominator of 2AB. And your fraction at the end is 4B plus 2A over 2AB. But we can simplify that by just pulling all the 2s out, canceling them. And we get 2B plus A over AB as the ultimate average of the rates that we need. Then we need to solve for the time as 10. So, time, or sorry, for the time of uh, 10 miles, right? So we've got T is then equal to the distance divided by, so that distance of 10 that we're seeking, divided by 2B plus A over AB. Then you just have to multiply by the reciprocal to discover that t, which is the thing that we were looking for, Callum's time, 
is going to be equal to 10AB over 2B plus A, which matches the expression in choice E exactly. Now, again, remember that this has to be both apparent and simple to you in the moment. So if at any time you're working through a technical problem or a technical approach such as this for a word problem, if you get stuck, there may be an alternative tactic that you can evaluate as well. So if you get stuck, don't double down on the algebra, but this is how you would do it. And it, you can see it's probably fastest if you can manage your technical algebraic manipulations here for this word problem. So let's take a look at an arithmetic example next. So we've got a clearly technical math question, giant square root with some numbers in parentheses underneath. So just as before, set up the scratch pad, listing the choices vertically A to E and write out the numbers in the choices. This time I probably would write them out because we've just got simple numbers, albeit with square roots. So we want to note the format of the choices to inform efficient manipulations as we go. They're not asking for an approximation here. So you really have to technically solve this. There is not going to be an alternative method to solving this problem. And you can see that a square root is possible as an answer as well, because we've got three root five and 10 root three as options A and D respectively. So this informs our approach to say, we have to remove common factors to simplify these roots. So we're just going to ignore the square root symbol for now and seek common factors from our substitution, or sorry, our subtraction. So we've got 27 times 10 minus nine times five. Obviously, there is a common factor of 9 in both 27 and 9 itself. So we pull that 9 out, and we now have a parenthetical quantity of 9 times 3 times 10 minus 1 times 5. Pulling out the 9 from 27, leaving behind the 3. Pulling out the 9 from 9, leaving behind the minus 1. Then we have to process that parenthesis. So... Now we just have nine times 30 minus five. So that means we're looking at nine times 25 when we just process that difference. We'll put the radical back in, and now we have nine times 25 as the square root we're actually taking when we manipulate here. So that means both of these are perfect squares, so we can square root nine to produce a three, square root 25 to produce a five, and we know that by distributing the radical, we really just have 3 times 5 is equal to 15, which is choice E. And again, there isn't really an alternative way to solve this problem. You really are going to have to lead in, lean into the technical arithmetic here, or recognize that sometimes discretion is the better part of valor. And if you cannot find a path forward on something this technical arithmetically, you're probably in a better position if you just look at it and go, well, I have to be able to move on here quickly because it's not gonna get better if I'm just staring at it. So make an educated guess, use your uh, letter of the day. Again, there's not even really a whole lot you can do from a logical estimation standpoint with this problem, unless you actually understand the manipulation we just did. So this may just be your letter of the day if you're looking at this, say, question 13 and going, I don't remember how to manipulate all of this under the radical. So. Next, we'll take a look at a geometric example. So same general setup here. We've got a little figure. We've got a, <clears throat> we've got a uh, question being asked. So as always, set up the scratch pad, list the choices vertically, A through E. And again, simple numbers in the choices. So we'd go ahead and just write these out. Then, of course, skip to the end, figure out what you're being asked for. In this case, we're being asked for the area of the rectangle that is inscribed in that circle. Then we want to write out the formulas, and by doing this, try to avoid drawing if we can. Because yes, I could draw this out, but it's going to take some time, and instead we'll just rely on what we know mathematically for this figure, rather than trying to reproduce it, trying to draw it to scale, and taking time to do so. So we know that we're being asked for area, so that means we need to know length times width, because that is how you derive the area of a rectangle. We also, however, get the information of a diameter of the circle, and we need to conceptually realize that that diameter is equal to the diagonal of our rectangle, because this is the key to the entire problem. So we know that that diagonal is going to be 10 because the diameter is 10, and it would just cut across from corner to corner here on the, on the circle and thereby the rectangle. Then... We also know 
the Pythagorean theorem that the diagonal squared is going to be equal to length squared plus width squared. So again, you have to synthesize the information and realize that once you draw that diagonal mentally, that you've created a right triangle in your rectangle as well. And these happen to work with Pythagorean integers. So if our diagonal is 10, we know that our length and our width would have to be 6 and 8 respectively. It doesn't even matter which order, but we know that it's 6 and 8. So that means our length is 6, our 8 is for our width, and our diagonal is 10. So the area of the rectangle is just that length times width, 6 times 8, 48, and our answer is choice C. So our process for technical mathematics on problem solving questions in the quantitative section. First, set up the scratch pad A through E every time. Note if you've got algebraic expressions or numbers in the choices to help inform your calculation because and along with tactics because it is going to maximize that efficiency that you really need to be focused on for this exam. Then step two, skip to the end of the problem, label the choices as your sought value or uh, values depending on how they're being asked for. Note if you're seeking a specific or non-specific value. And don't auto-solve for individual values if you're seeking the combined value. For instance, there in that geometric problem, we don't even know which is the length and the width. It doesn't matter. And there are problems where they ask for like area or com a combination of variables where it can be really onerous or impossible to solve for the individuals definitively, but the combination is absolutely certain. So beware of auto-solving for individual values if the problem is seeking some sort of combination algebraically. And then our third step, read from the beginning, taking notes and doing the obviously necessary calculations to maximize your efficiency. Take that technical path to solving if you can. Consider it first, but of course, abandon it quickly if at any time it ceases to be both simple and apparent to you personally in the moment. So those are our steps for technical mathematics when dealing with problem solving on the quantitative section of the exam. Let's hop on over to the whiteboard and take a look at one more example of how to apply technical math on the GMAT quantitative problem solving questions. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this sample problem solving question using all of the tactics we just spoke about. So of course, set up the scratch pad first, A, B, C, D, E, label out on top for when we look for what the question is seeking. We've got 3, 5, 10, 12, 25, which just some simple numbers, so we'll write those out. So then we skip to the end. The value of y cubed is how many times the value of x squared? So y cubed times x squared equals question mark. <laughs> so we then immediately start taking notes as we go. So we know that x y does not equal zero. So that means that neither x nor y individually is zero. And 3x squared is, so equals 60%, so 0.6 of times 20%, so 0.2 of y cubed. So now, we want to get rid of those decimals first. They're just making this math harder than we need. So we'll do that by multiplying the whole equation by 10. So that gets us 30 X squared is equal to, uh, well, actually I'm going to have to multiply one by 100 because I got to get rid of both of those points. So we'll have three and then zero, zero here. Because remember, you've got to distribute your multiplication. So if we just multiply by 10, that gets us 0. 0.6 to 6, but not 0. 0.2 to 2. So we multiply by 100, we get 300x squared is now equal to 6 times 2 times y cubed. So 300x squared is now equal to 12y cubed. And so then we just have to divide by 12. And remember, long division is just bad marketing. So if you have to, 12 goes into 300, two times, two times 12 is 24. Subtract out the 24 from the 30. We now have six, drop down our zero, 12 goes into 60, 25 times. So we're left with 25 X squared is equal to Y cubed. We have absolutely no need to further solve for either X squared 
or y cubed because we remember we're being asked for how many times x squared is y cubed and there is our answer right there in 25. So you could see the technical approach relatively direct and relatively uh, expedient on this problem. Could you plug in or do an alternative tactic here? Sure, but I don't really want to if we just follow common constructs of algebra and simplification of the manipulation we can get to 25 in well under the two minute per question average on the quantitative section so good luck as you continue to do some practice problems and attempt to use the technical approach for gmat problem solving questions when it's both simple and apparent to you in the moment